Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Well, guys, it's hard to believe, but I have officially been lead pastor of St. Peter's for six months. That's it. You guys laugh. Why? Six months. That's all it's been. And it feels like it's been longer because we've been here for more than a year now. We've been here for almost a year and uh, a year and a half. And it's been an exciting year and a half. But six months ago, as I took over the reins from Pastor Taiki, I committed to the congregation that my top priority would be working on a vision to move us into the future. And today, I am so very excited because today we launch that new vision for St. Peter's Lutheran Church and School. Over the next six weeks, as we move closer and closer to Easter, we are going to be looking at all the different facets, all the different pieces of the recipe, so to speak, for the vision as we move towards 2028. Now, not all of us may understand when I say vision what I mean within this context of church. Because we're not necessarily talking about new glasses. Although I think I need new glasses with bifocals. It's starting to happen, guys. It's terrible. What we're talking about is a preferred future. A picture of a future that we believe God is calling us toward. And the goal of the next six weeks is to really help all of us come into that vision and to see it clearly so that we can move together with unity as the body of Christ towards that place where God is calling us to help us make that vision reality. But before I begin to paint that picture for you, I want to share with you briefly how we got to this point. You see, back in October of 2021, I sat right there with Pastor Taiki, and he kind of interviewed me. It was my first time I got an opportunity to talk with you guys from up here on a Sunday morning. And he asked me an important question. He said, John, what are you most excited about for the future at St. Peter's? And I shared with him and with you that I was most excited about seeing our congregation grow younger. To see our young people begin to own their faith and own their congregation. And what I meant by that was this. That every child, every kid, every student, every college student, every young adult would feel welcomed and invited into this place. That they would feel at home like they belong here at St. Peter's. And that they would invest their life into the ministry that we have here. And that they would have an opportunity to grow in their faith and deepen their relationship with Jesus Christ. And from this point, this idea, this concept began to roll out. Last year throughout 2022, I shared in Table Talks with you guys this idea of what would it look like for St. Peter's to grow younger and deeper in Christ. And with each Table Talk, as I asked you guys, what do you think about that? That concept, that idea, just sort of resonated with everybody. So much so that it became clear that God wanted to take this and do something with it. And so over the last six months, I've been working with our church council, our leaders, and you, our congregation, through 20 plus vision forms in which I shared with you a bigger picture of what it means to grow younger and deeper in Christ. And through those 20 vision forms, we had over a thousand suggestions and comments and questions that came in from the congregation and in fact if you want to see most of those comments you can walk down the hallway here off of fifth street see a number of them and if you walk from here all the way over to the old gym it's just a, a trail of comments from you our congregation and with each vision form it seemed as though that god was confirming that this was the direction that we needed to be going. And so like I said, I'm excited today to share with you that I believe with all of my heart, with every fiber of my being, that God is calling us to grow younger and deeper in Christ. I believe that by 2028, God desires us as a people, as a congregation to be positioned to effectively 
connect the next generation to Christ and lead them to lifelong discipleship. So, what does that mean for us? Well, that means that in five years, when you come into this place, when you walk into St. Peter's, you're going to say to yourself, holy cow, look at all the young people here. This is incredible. You're going to feel energy. You're going to feel excitement as we engage the next generation and lead them to a deep and meaningful relationship in Jesus Christ. You're going to feel that energy as it grows. It means that our biblical faith will grow stronger as we build a sure and firm foundation for life, for our young families, our students, our children, and everyone. It means that we won't shy away from the hard questions that are being asked today. Instead, we're going to answer those hard questions because the next generation is having to answer those questions. And we're going to do it with the truth of Scripture. But we're going to do it in the most gracious way possible, all so that the life of Jesus Christ would be experienced by every single person who comes to this place. So let me say it again. I believe that God is calling us to grow younger and deeper in Christ. To be positioned by 2028 to effectively connect the next generation to Jesus and lead them to that lifelong discipleship. And as I said earlier, this series is meant to take us deeper into that vision and to explore God's heart and desire for us moving forward. And so to that end, I want to take us into our Old Testament reading. Just show of hands, how many of you guys have ever read through the book of Ezekiel? Yeah, not many people. Last night there's a few more. Ezekiel is one of those Old Testament books we don't often go to because it's kind of confusing. It's filled with one vision after another. And in our passage today from Ezekiel 47, what we receive is just that, a vision. We said a vision is a picture of a preferred future. And that's what God gives Ezekiel in chapter 47. is a picture of his kingdom, the fulfillment of his kingdom. And what we see there is God's temple filled with his glory. And trickling out from the opening, the, the threshold, the front door of that temple is just a little bit of water. And as that water trickles out from the threshold, two incredible things happen. You see, wherever that water flows, life flows with it. Wherever it goes, life springs up. And not just a little bit of life, but a ton of life, a plethora of life. It is amazing how much life is brought by this trickle of water. The other thing that it does is as that water flows out from the temple, the further out it gets, the wider it gets, and the deeper it gets. And it flows into the very ends of the earth, bringing that life to everywhere it goes. This is a picture that God is painting of the future. It's one of his glory and his life reaching out to all the expanses of the earth and bringing life out of death and salvation to every place and every person that needs it. And what we see in this picture is that far out vision of the future. But here's what I want you to understand. That while this is a picture of the future, that future is already taking place in the present. And that future picture, that vision, already began to take shape back in Jesus Christ. In the work and the person of Jesus, God's water began to trickle from his temple in heaven. When Jesus came to earth and began his ministry. With the coming of Christ, that water began to flow. To flow from God's temple in heaven. As Jesus went from place to place, and everywhere he went, that water flowed with him. And everywhere he went, he brought life out of death and healing to the sick. And in John 7, 37 and 38, Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles, a huge feast among the Jewish people. And he stands up in a crowd, and he says, let anyone, anyone, who is thirsty, come to me and drink. 
Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And he says, whoever, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, living rivers of living water will flow from within them. You see, as each person drank of the waters of Jesus, new life sprang up from within them. And they were born again, young, all over again. And with each new person, who those streams of living water began to enter and flow from. Those waters grew deeper and deeper. More and more came to know Jesus. And still today, that same water flows from the temple of God through Jesus into you and into me. And it brings new life for us each and every day and deepens our faith each and every day. And God has given to us here at St. Peter's the blessed work of making sure that that water continues to flow from this place and from us as a people of God. And so in a very real way, we are a part of this vision that Ezekiel receives. We are a part of the fulfillment of that vision as we look ahead. But before we go any further, I want to talk a little bit about Ezekiel's context because I think it's important. You see, Ezekiel lived in a time of exile. It was a time when a nation named Babylon, a superpower, had crossed from the east to the west, the desert, and came to conquer Israel, wiped out Israel, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and raised God's temple to the ground, left it with nothing but rubble. And then they took all of the most influential leaders and people of Israel, and they packed them up, and they forcibly moved them to Babylon and forced them to settle in a foreign land among foreign people in a foreign culture surrounded by foreign gods. And it's a moment when not just the people, but Ezekiel himself wondered, where is God in all this? You see, the people had this notion, this idea, this belief that God's power, God's rule, God's reign was somehow somewhat contained to the boundaries of Israel. His glory contained to the place of the temple. And what now? They had moved to this foreign place with foreign gods. And there was nothing left in Israel but rubble. And on one day, Ezekiel is sitting by the Kebar River there in Babylon, mourning what has happened. And on the horizon, he sees something he's never seen before. Coming off of the horizon, coming with the clouds, he sees a vision of a throne with wheels. And sitting on that throne is the likeness of the glory of God. He sees God himself coming out of the north with the clouds and with power. As if to say, Ezekiel, here I am. With all of my power. With all of my glory. That goes way beyond anything that you can comprehend. It goes beyond the boundaries of Israel. It goes beyond the boundaries and the power of Babylon. It goes beyond the boundaries and the imagination that you have. And as Ezekiel sat on that shore side, he saw that God began to do something new, something he had never seen before. And it challenged the way that Ezekiel thought, it challenged the way that Ezekiel believed, and it challenged the way he lived. Ezekiel was meant to be a priest, and now suddenly finds himself a prophet in a foreign land speaking to his people, trying to call them back and to remind them that even though they are in exile in this foreign land surrounded by a foreign culture and foreign gods, God, their God, is still with them. And this new thing that God was doing was in a very real way bringing his kingdom to earth. And that really begins to take shape in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus comes with a new thing. He brings a new work of God to earth as he brings the kingdom of God to bear on our lives. But here's the thing, not everyone liked what Jesus was bringing. Not everyone appreciated what Jesus was bringing in the kingdom of heaven because what he brought challenged them. It challenged them out of their comfort zones. It challenged them to embrace different, a different way of thinking about God's kingdom, a different way of thinking about their faith and their relationship to God, a different way of thinking about God's people. 
Jesus challenged them to embrace crazy ideas like the last shall be first and the first shall be last. To gain your life, you have to lose it. And blessed are the poor, the meek, and the hungry, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Jesus challenged the way everyone understood their relationship to God and how they would participate in his kingdom. And so people began to push back, and understandably so. You start shifting things on me, I don't understand it. I go, whoa, hold on. And so to help his disciples and the people around him gain clarity on why things were so different, Jesus shares a short parable on new wine and new wineskins. He says this, No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. You see, the new thing that God was doing in Christ and bringing his kingdom and the gospel, it couldn't and it wouldn't fit into the old way of thinking, the old way of understanding life and doing things. This new thing that was being revealed in Jesus was so much greater than anything that anyone had ever seen. And the only thing that could hold it was a new wineskin. As many of you know, Melissa and I, my wife, we have a wonderful family with five kids, and we've got a picture here for you. This is taken about four years ago, and we often, people say, well, how many kids do you say have? We often say five, but the reality, as you look at this picture, you'll see our sixth child up there. He's dressed in bright yellow. That is my baby. I've talked about it. I talk about it all the time. I love to talk about it. I love that car almost as much as I love my kids. I know it inside and out. They might say I love it more. I know it inside and out. I know all of its quirks, and I love to drive it. No power steering, no anti-lock brakes, 60 horsepower under the hood, and trying to find first gear is like solving a thousand-piece puzzle, just trying to find it till it shifts. When you start it, you got to pump the pedal twice, push the pedal halfway down, you say a prayer, and you turn that key, and you hope it'll start. I love this car. And I would drive it every day, but they put salt on our roads and it would ruin it. So I was so excited when my oldest turned 16 and got his driver's license. Because I thought, dude, yes, finally I can teach him to drive my car. And so one day we got out into the neighborhood. I pulled the car out and I threw Matt right into the driver's seat. And I got to tell you, don't ever try and teach a teenager today how to drive a stick in a car that's 56 years old because it didn't go so well he did it right he pumped the gas twice put the pedal halfway down we said a prayer and it started he pushed the clutch in and we sat there for 30 seconds as he tried to find first gear I pushed it in for him and then finally he begins to let the clutch out and you know what happens right the car lurches forward and goes boom stops dead stalls it out so we say the prayer, we start the car, and he gets it going. And off we go, bouncing down the road, trying to shift gears. For over an hour, we worked on driving that car, and we made it through our neighborhood and back to the house. We stop, and we get out, and I am grinning ear to ear, because I am pumped, man. He has learned to drive this car. He gets out, and I say, Matt, what would you think? And he goes, Dad... Never, ever will I ever drive this car again. I said, what? And he goes, Dad, I love your car, and I will cruise with you anywhere you go. But for me to drive it, never going to happen again. And I got to admit, that moment, I was devastated. Like, my heart broke because I'm thinking, dude, it's my oldest. He's going to learn to love this car. He's going to inherit this car when there's no parts out there, and it's going to become a rust bucket, and he's going to keep it up for me, and it's going to be awesome. And what I realized in that moment is that the new wine of my son didn't fit into the old wineskin of my 66 Volkswagen Beetle. Our vision 
moving forward. Growing younger and deeper in Christ is about connecting the next generation to Jesus. It's about new wine that needs new wineskins. This means prioritizing young people. That's people 30 years and younger in every area of our life together to ensure that our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids are passionately following Jesus all of their days. And I'll tell you what, one thing I've learned as a parent of a college student and a high schooler and younger is that their perspectives are so different than mine. The way they view and interact with the world is so different than mine. And it's because their experiences growing up have been so different than mine. You see, the world that they have grown up in has a global view of the world, not a national or a local one. They first see the whole world because they're connected to the whole world. The world that they have grown up in is a world of terrorism and religious wars and not the kind you hear about on the other side of the ocean but the kind that has hit home. It's become normalized. They have never known the joy of meeting their family at the gate at an airport as the family comes off the airplane. They have only, only ever known a world of metal detectors and TSA screeners. When my son who's 16 was in kindergarten. That was the year that Sandy Hook Elementary tragedy took place. He has grown up in a world of school security where fire drills are as often as lockdown drills and intruder drills are in school. They have grown up in a world with constant access to ideas and thoughts in a way that we never imagined possible the world has been at their fingertips since they were two, literally, waiting for influencers to come into their lives at any second from any place. There are new concepts of human sexuality, of human dignity, of human rights that they are wrestling with. There are new questions that no one has asked. And here's the thing, it's going to be up to this new generation to answer those questions. And because of all these experiences and differences in their world, to reach the next generation and connect them to Christ in that lifelong discipleship, a new thing has to happen among God's people. We have to embrace a new generation and learn to appreciate what they have to offer for God's kingdom. And in order to keep in step with the Holy Spirit, as he does a new thing even among us, God needs new wineskins. And since God needs new wineskins, God is going to make new wineskins to receive the new things he wants to do. And ready or not, like it or not, God has chosen you and me to make out of us new wineskins, to receive the new wine, the new things that God is going to do among us. We talk about life transformation here at St. Peter's. A life transformation is already starting and beginning in our lives as God prepares us to move forward, to grow younger and deeper in Christ. And I'm convinced that it is His will, God's will, that His kingdom continues to grow in this place and among us as His people. And I believe that God has given us this congregation, all the potential to be a new wineskin for reaching the next generation. Over the next five weeks, we are going to continue in our teaching series to dig into what it means to grow younger and deeper in Christ. And as we do that, I want to challenge you. It's not an invitation. It's not an ask. In fact, it's kind of borderline order. Okay, so kind of hear this in the nicest possible way. I command you, I order you to do three things over the next five weeks. First, commit to being here. Be here every Saturday or Sunday or join us online if you can't be for the next five weeks and really six because the sixth week from here is Easter. You don't want to miss that. Be here every single week. Because it is so incredibly important that we as God's people here at St. Peter's have clarity about where we're heading so that we can move forward unified as the body of Christ. So be here. Don't miss any of them. The second piece of this 
is invite someone, a friend, a family, to see the future. There are so many people out there who have watched as their kids have grown up in this world or their grandkids are growing up in it. And they have asked, what is the church doing? What do we do? How do we keep them connected to Jesus? It's some of uh, our, our greatest fears. And if you've got someone in your life who needs to know where we're heading, I want to challenge you to invite them to come and hear what God is beginning to do among us. And finally, I want you to pray. I want you to get down on your knees, and I want you to pray consistently for the next five straight weeks. And here's what I want you to pray. Lord, help me to trust. Help me to trust you to make me a new wineskin. I said earlier, when Jesus came and he began to do a new thing, it was challenging to some people. They didn't like it. And I think for us as God's people, whenever God begins to move, it can be challenging. To go, are you really serious about this? Are we going there? And the answer is yes, we are. And I want you to pray that the Lord would move your heart to follow with us. And that you would be open to his transformative work of making each one of us a new wineskin for the new things he is doing in Jesus. I want to close with these words from Psalm 78. We spoke some of them together earlier, but I think it's so incredibly appropriate on a day like today. The psalmist writes, My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He has done, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and not forget His deeds, but would keep His commandments. Guys, that's our call. To tell the next generation our children, the children not yet born, and their children, to tell them of the great deeds of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what He has done for them and their life. And to make sure that they never forget whose they are in Jesus. I'm excited about what the next five weeks will bring for our congregation. I'm excited about the way that the Holy Spirit has already begun to move here at St. Peter's. And I hope that over the next five weeks, you will continue to gain clarity along with me as we look at that vision, that picture of the preferred future that we believe God is calling us to. Amen.